We have already mentioned our belief that civilization is an object that can be studied in a scientific way just as a quartz crystal can be studied. In such a study we must, like the student of crystals, examine in a comparative way a large number of examples, even, ideally, all the examples available. But it is obvious that a civilization is a much more complicated object than a crystal. Let us be explicit about that word complicated. A civilization is complicated, in the first place, because it is dynamic, that is, it is constantly changing in the passage of time, until it has perished. First, third more. A civilization is part of the social sciences, that is, it contains subjective elements, and these are usually the more important elements in a culture. Accordingly, in a civilization, unlike a crystal, what people think or feel can influence what exists, changing the object completely in the process. In the third place, Many aspects of a civilization are continua, existing in such subtle gradations and in such varied degrees of abstractness that the divisions we make in it, in the course of our analysis, and the words we use as symbols to refer to our analytical divisions reflect only very roughly the situation that exists in the reality itself. All three of these difficulties are important, but the third, which is frequently ignored in discussions of these matters, requires a little further examination. For that reason, at least, much, if not all, of the physical world consists of continuity. To say this is equivalent to saying that much of the physical world is irrational. It exists and it operates, but it does these things in ways that cannot be grasped by our conscious rational mental processes. This can be seen most easily if we consider first a few examples of continuity in the physical world. How many colors are there in a rainbow? Some answer three, red, yellow, blue. Others answer six, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet. When I was a child in school, for some unknown reason, we were told that there were seven colors. The teacher inserting indigo between blue and violet. The proper answer, of course, is that the number of colors in the rainbow is infinite. This in itself is something we cannot grasp in any rational way. But let us consider what it means. In the first place it means that there is, in the rainbow, no real line of division between any two colors. If we wish to draw a line we may do so, but we must recognize that such a line is imaginary. It may exist in our minds, but it does not exist in the rainbow itself. Moreover, any line that we draw is arbitrary in the sense that it could have been drawn with just as much justification somewhere else, perhaps only a hair red away. If we draw a line between red and orange and another between orange and yellow, we may call the gamma between those two lines orange, but, as a matter of fact, the color is quite different on either edge of that gamma. We may decide that orange is a narrower range than the gamma between our two lines and, accordingly, slice off the margins of the orange gamma.
calling the severed margin on one side yellow-orange and the severed margin on the other side red-orange. But once again the color is not the same across any of these three ranges. In fact, it is impossible to cut off any gamma in a rainbow, no matter how narrow we make it in which the color is the same across the width of the gamut. We can move no distance, however infinitesimally small it may be, across the rainbow without a change in color. This means that the number of colors in the rainbow is infinite. But it also means that the number of colors in any portion of the rainbow is infinite. That is, there are as many shades of orange as there are colors in the whole rainbow, since both are infinite. Now, this is a truth that we cannot understand rationally. It seems contrary to logic and reason that we could add all the existing shades of red and yellow to all the existing varieties of orange without increasing the number of color varieties we have. The reason is not so much that infinity added to infinity gives infinity as that there are no different varieties of colors at all, because there are in fact, no dividing lines in the rainbow itself. When we use the plural terms colors and shades in reference to a rainbow, we are implying that there are different colors and accord, accordingly that there are divisions in the rainbow somehow seepeth, rating one shade from another and thus entitling us to speak of these in the plural. Since there are no such lines of separation, we would be more accurate if we spoke of the rainbow in the singular as a continuum of color. But, of course, we could not do this consistently because it would make it impossible to think about or to talk about the colors of any objects. Since the continuum changes across its range, it is distinctly different in color from one portion to another, just as dresses, flowers, or neckties are different in color from one another. If we are going to talk about these very real differences, we must have different words for the different colors involved. Thus we must give different color terms to different portions of the rainbow's gamut. The important truth to remember is that, while the differences between colors are real enough, there are no real divisions between colors. These are arbitrary and imaginary. As is well known, the gamma of radiations of visible light that we call the rainbow is not an entity in itself but is an arbitrary and imaginary portion cut out of a much wider gamma of electromagnetic radiations. The variety of colors in the rainbow arises from the fact that the radiations of visible light come at us in wavelengths of different fra quinky. As the wavelengths of these radiant forms of energy get smaller and thus their frequency gets larger we will be served this difference as a shift in color toward the blue end of the visible spectrum. As the wavelengths get longer and the frequency less we observe the color shift toward the red end of the spectrum. If this shift of wavelength continues, the radiation may pass beyond the range to which our eyes are sensitive. Beyond the red we can notice these radiations as heat infrared beyond the violet we might have difficulty noticing the radiations directly, but their consequence would soon appear as a kind of sunburn on our skin.
Once again there is no dividing line between the visible gamma of radiations and the ultraviolet on one side and the infrared on the other side. Some persons can see further into these than others can, and other forms of living creatures can see further into one or the other range than any human could. These, for example, are fully sensitive to ultraviolet radiations, while humans are generally so insensitive to these that they consider glass windows, which cut off most ultraviolet, as being fully transparent. The gamma of radiant energy is much wider than the three sub we have mentioned. Beyond the invisible ultra Violet are other radiations of even shorter wavelength, including soft X-rays, hard X-rays, and finally the very high frequency gamma waves released by nuclear explosions. Going the other way in the radiation range, we find that there are radiations of increasing wavelength beyond the infrared which we call heat. These radiations of lower frequency and longer wavelength include those used to carry our radio and television broadcasts. While we sit here red, thing, quite unaware of their passage, these radiations are going through our bodies. They are different from the visible light that allows us to see to read only in the wavelengths and energy content of the radiations. This great gamma or range of energy radiations, from the shortest gamma waves at one end to the longest broadcast waves at the other end, forms a continuum. The difference between the deadly gamma radiation and an enjoyable tele vision broadcast, like the difference between red and blue, is a very real difference, but it is only a difference of wavelength and thus a difference of distance and not a difference of kind. Accordingly, no real lines of demarcation exist in the gamma itself and the whole range forms a single continuum. The quality of being a continuum that exists in a range of electromagnetic radiations is not a quality that has any thing to do with energy or with radiations, but is true simply because these radiations exist in space and differ from one another because of space distinctions, namely, their wavelengths. This spectrum is a continuum, and therefore irrational, because space is a continuum, and therefore irrational. The irrationality of space sounds a little strange to most of us because we are so familiar with space that we rarely stop to think that we do not really understand it. But the irrational quality of space which arises from the fact that space is infinitely divisible is one of the early discoveries of ancient intellectual history. By 2000 BC the Babylonians were familiar with the fact that the square of the hypotenuse of a right angle triangle is equal to the sum of the squares of the other two sides introduced to the Greeks in a general sized form by Pythagoras before 500 BC. This statement came to be called the Pythagorean Theorem. Unfortunately, Pythagoras also taught that reality was rational and that the truth can be found by the use of reason and logic alone, without any need for observation through the senses which would merely serve to confuse us. This rationalist method for discovering the nature of reality was accepted by Socrates and Plato and, in his earlier period, by Aristotle.
Tottle and led to the death of ancient science by contributing to a denigration of observation, testing of hypotheses, and experiment. It is one of the great ironies of history that thinkers like Pythagoras and Plato helped to kill ancient science by propagating the belief that observation was not necessary since reality was rational and therefore its nature could be found by the use of reason and logic alone. Long after the pupil of Pythagoras, Hippasus of Metapontium, had used the Pythagorean theorem to demonstrate that space and thus reality is irrational. The demonstration of the irrationality of space arose from the proof that the diagonal of a square is incommensurable with its side. We would say that, if the side of a square is one unit long, its diagonal, by the Pythagorean theorem, is j slash two units long, and the square root of two, we say, is an irrational number. But few of us really know what we mean by the word irrational in this sense. There are three ways of looking at it, each a slightly different way of looking at a quite irrational situation. We sometimes say that flash 2 is an endless decimal which begins with 1.414 to 1 and con continues forever in an infinite series of digits which never ends and never repeats itself. Or we could say that y2 is a number which cannot be expressed as a fraction, that is, as a ratio between irrational numbers. But both of these state are simply alternative ways of talking about the utterly irrational fact that there is no common unit of distance, no matter how small we make it, which will go into the side of a square a certain number of times and will also go into the diagonal of the square a round number of times without anything left over. Rationally we would think that if we took as a unit of measurement a distance which was infinitely small, like one sextillion of a cat's whisker or even one sextillion of that or however small the unit was needed, that we could eventually find a unit so small that it would go evenly into both the side and the diagonal but the fact is that there is no unit, however small, which will go evenly into both distances, so that there is no common unit between them, and we must say that they are in the messer table. But this is not a situation that is rationally compared, sensible to our conscious reasoning powers, and it is quite non-logical. But it is true. This quality of irrationality of space is not something exceptional, either in space or in other aspects of reality. The radius of a circle is similarly incommensurable with its circumference. The irrational relationship between the two distances is signified by the ratio we call 77. This quality of irrationality rests on the fact that space is infinitely divisible, no matter how close together we make two points, the number of points between them remains infinite. The infinite colors of the rainbow, like the incommensurability of a square and its diagonal or of a circle and its radius are simply applications of this irrational quality of space. A similar irrational quality is to be found in time. We usually think of time as a succession of intervals. It is really a continuous flow, and any intervals we may choose to put into it 
be they second hours or centuries are arbitrary and imaginary and in consequence any conclusions we derive or any inferences we may draw from such intervals may be mistaken we have 24 hours in the day as a purely conventional arrangement going back to our early ancestors in the Neolithic garden cultures who had a number birth system based on 12 and passed on to us as the relics of that system such arrangements as 12 eggs in a dozen 12 inches in a foot 12 pennies in a shilling 20 four parts in a carrot, twelve ounces in a pound of gold, twelve deities on Mount Olympus, and many other odd facts of which one of the most pervasive today is that teen age begins with thirteen. From the Neolithic belief that day or night should each have twelve parts we derived our twenty-four hour day but since these divisions are arbitrary and imaginary, we could with equal justification have a day of 10 hours or of 23 or 25 hours. Most of us are familiar with the paradoxes of Zeno, especially with the one about a race between Achilles and a tortoise. Zeno argued that if the tortoise got a head start, Achilles could never catch up with him even if he could run much faster. Zeno felt that if the tortoise was a certain distance ahead when Achilles started, the tortoise would move forward a little farther while Achilles was covering the handicap distance and would, thus, still be ahead when Achilles finished the handicap distance. Accordingly, Achilles must keep on running to overcome the new increment, but by the time he had made up that increment the tortoise would have moved forward the new amount and would still be slightly ahead. According to Zeno, this process would continue forever, the tortoise advancing the decreasingly small amount while Achilles was making up the tortoise's previous increment. The mathematician might say that the distance between the two would approach zero as a limit but would reach that limit only after an infinite number of intervals either of time or of distance and that Achilles would, accordingly, not catch up in any finite number of intervals. The explanation of this paradox of Zeno's rests on the fact that the space and time through which the contestants are running are both continua, but Zeno, by treating them as if they were a succession of intervals, introduced an untrue condition and from this contrary to fact assumption that lie more. Space exists as a sequence of intervals he derived a contrary to fact conclusion that Achilles can't never catch up. Such paradoxes are good examples of the methodological rule that logic and rationality do not apply to continued as we shall show later. This is one of the basic rules of historical method although, it must be confessed, few historians give it much thought. Space and time are not the only continua. Another familiar example is the system of real numbers. Since this is a continuum, we can state the rule. No two numbers can be placed so close together that there is not an infinite number of numbers between them. For example, between 3 and 4 are an infinite number of numbers. One of these is IT. As we have said, 77 is irrational, and, accordingly, 
although it is a very exact number, we cannot write it with the ordinary ten symbols used in writing numbers. If we say that 77 is 3.14, we do not refer to a single number but are really saying that 77 is one of the infinite number of numbers in the gamma from 3.135 to 3.145. In that gamma, we could indicate that 77 was in a much narrower gamma which still contains an infinite number of numbers by writing its value as 3.141592. This refers to the infinite number of numbers in the gamma of numbers ranging from 3.141591523. 3.1415925 Since the value of 77 is known to over a thousand decimal places, we can define the gamma of numbers within which lies more and more narrowly simply by carrying the numerical expression for it to more decimal places. But each gamma no matter how narrow it gets, refers to an infinite number of numbers, because the system of real numbers is a continuum. To those who are not familiar with mathematics, all of this discussion of flash 2 and of 77 may seem very strange, fun, real, and unapplicable to anything with which they are concerned. I hope to show that the remarks I have just made about numbers are applicable not only to statements we all make about many familiar things but also to history. The moment's thought will show that any statement about any continuum is just the same kind of statement as that which we have just made about TV. Just as any value we may give to refers to a gamma containing an infinite number of numbers and this gamma can be made narrower by carrying our statement of the value of TV to more decimal places. So any statement about any color refers to a gamma that contains an infinite number of colors. Thus the word orange does not refer to a single color anymore than 3.14 refers to a single number but rather refers to the gamma of colors between red and yellow. If we narrow this gamma by speak thing of yellow-orange, we still are referring to an infinite number of colors. And we could make the gamut narrower by referring to orange-yellow-orange orange or to yellow-yellow-orange, thus bisecting the previous gamut. This process could be continued indefinitely, just as the value of TT can be carried to more decimal places. The value, however, of carrying either very far is not large. We have been talking about rainbows, numbers, and space-time in order to establish what we mean by a continuum. Now we can define the term in the sense that we shall use it in discussing history. The continuum is a heterogeneous unity each point of which differs from all the suitors grounding points but differs from them by such subtle gradations in any one respect that no boundaries exist in the unity itself, and it can be divided into parts only by imaginary and arbitrary boundaries. We might add that some continue are perfect while others are highly imperfect the distinction being that a perfect continuum has an infinite number of gradations between any two boundaries drawn in it, no matter how closely together they are drawn, while an imperfect continuum has a finite number of gradations between at least some of the boundaries drawn in the continuum.
For example, the gamma variations of light intensity during any 24-hour period is a perfect continuum. But the races of mankind, however defined, are an imperfect continuum. For the Vari, variations in any standard we set as a criterion for race can be no more numerous than the number of individual human persons on the earth, that is, no more than a few billion variations instead of the infinite number we expect to find in a perfect continuum. If, for example, we set color of skin as the criterion of race, and we were to arrange the human beings on the globe in some magical fashion in a long line with the blackest black man at one end and next to him, the second blackest man, and so on, in ascending order of light reflection from their skin surfaces, until we pass through all the blacks, browns, reds, yellows, and whites to end up with the widest white man on the globe, possibly an albino Norwegian. If we were to do this, I feel confident there would be no place on that long line where any two adjacent persons would have any difference in skin color sufficient to be distinguished by any normal physical process. We might then decide that men, based on skin color, form a single race. Or, if we insist on having more than one race, we might simply divide the line at its midpoint and settle for two races, the lights and the darks. But however many races we decided upon, there would be no discernible dif difference in skin color between any two adjacent persons between whom we drew a boundary line. Nevertheless, in the final analysis, this range of skin color would represent an imperfect continuum, because the variation of skin color between any two boundary lines or in the range of mankind as a whole would be numerable and not infinite. We might, on the other hand, arrange mankind in a line on the basis of height. In that case, we would have several billion variations over a total height difference of no more than 7 or 8 feet, giving an average difference B between any two adjacent persons of no more than 150 million of an inch, a difference which is, once again, too slight to be discernible by any normal procedures and is Indeed, considerably less than the normal increase and in decrease of any one person's height caused by rest and exercise during a day. Indeed, if we tried to arrange the persons of the world in order by height we would find the daily changes in individual height to be relatively so much greater than the average height differences between individuals that persons would be compelled, from their constantly changing heights, to change their positions in the line by hundreds of thousands hands and even millions of persons at relatively short intervals. If we were to use such a criterion as height as a measure of race, we could do so only so long as people were locally segregated into groups of obviously different average heights. As soon as people began to move about or mix socially, the classification would break down. And we could never classify racially, on this basis, any isolated individual. We deal with continued irrational either by dividing them into arbitrary intervals to which we give names, 
store by giving names to the two ends of the continuum and using these terms as if the middle ground did not exist at all. This last method is called polarizing the continuum, and is frequently done even when the greatest frequency of occurrence is in the middle range. When the telephone rings in the sorority house because someone wants a blind date, the sisters at once ask the vital question, is he tall or short? They ask this question even though it is perfectly obvious that the majority of men are neither tall nor short but are nearer the middle range. Such polarization of continuity is so common and so familiar that we come, frequently, to accept our categories as real instead of being arbitrary and imaginary, as they usually are. An accident report asks, day or night? Although accidents are most frequent when it is neat for day nor night, but dusk. Many questionnaires all arise continue by asking us to check, white, colored, man, woman, pro, con. In English law this is done in the distinctions between adult, juvenile or sane, insane. In the social sciences it is done in such contrasts as monopoly, competition in economics, democratic, authoritarian or totalitarian, liberal in politics. We have already done it several times in this book as in the dichotomy between natural science and social science or between objective and subjective. The familiar polarization of man into spirit and flesh dominated religious ethics for centuries. This practice of slicing continued into parts or even into dual poles and giving names to these artificial categories is necessary if we are to think about the world or to talk about it. But we must always remain alert to the danger of belief, being that our terms are real or refer to reality except by rough approximation. Only by making such divisions can we deal in a rational way with the many non-rational aspects of the world. We could, of course, renounce any desire to deal with the world rationally and content ourselves with successful non-rational dealings with it. We can deal with the irrationality of space, time, quantities number, race, color, and so forth, simply by action. Merely to walk, or to run like Achilles, is to deal with the irrationality of space and time and to discover, by action, who will win in a race. When we merely walk along, talking with our friends, we are, by walking, dealing successfully with space and time. No one could ever walk rationally. Simply stand still and make an effort to walk rationally. What is the first thing to do? And what should be done next? What messages must be given to which muscles and in what sequence? We do not know and we could not do such a complicated mental operation quickly enough to walk by any rational thinking process. When we approach history, we are dealing with a conglomeration of irrational continua. Those who deal with history by non-rational processes are the ones who make history, the actors in it. But the historian must deal with history by rational processes. Accordingly, 
he must be aware of the processes and difficulties to which we have referred when we try to deal with continue rationally. For history deals with changes in society, and all changes occurring in time involve continua. Both society and culture are, even if static, concerned with continua. Indeed, a society is a continuum of continua in five dimensions. When we say that a society or a civilization exists in five dimensions, we are referring to the fact that it exists in the three dimensions of space, the fourth dimension of time, and the fifth dimension of abstraction. All of these are easy to understand except the last. Let us look, for a moment, at this fifth dimension of abstraction. It is clear that every culture consists of concrete objects like clothes and weapons, of flesh tangible objects like emotions and feelings, and of quite abstract things like ideas. These form the dimension of abstraction. For example, in Western civilization we have such items as the following, A. Automobiles, B. Romantic love, C. Nationalism, D. Beethoven's string quartets, and C. The integral calculus. All of these are clearly products of Western civilization and could not have been produced by any other culture. They are of different degrees of AB, strictness and accordingly, we can say that Western culture exists in the fifth dimension, the dimension of abstraction. This is the same dimension as the gamma of human needs to which we previously referred. However, it is wider than this gamma. It may be similarly divided into six levels, in a rough and approximate fashion. These divisions are arbitrary and imaginary and even the order in which we list the levels is partly a matter of taste. These levels are, from the more abstract to the more concrete, one intellectual, two religion, three social, four economic, five political, and six military. Each of them could, if necessary, be subdivided into innumerable sublevels, as, for example, the economic into agriculture, commerce, and industry or into production, distribution and consumption. Such varied divisions and subdivisions are made possible by the fact that the reality is much more subtle and complex than are the categories of our thinking processes. Thus we may speak, for example, of the intellectual development or of the military deep development of a culture. The process of change on any single level we shall speak of as historical development always remembering that the divisions between levels are arbitrary and imaginary and that we can make as many or as few as we like because the levels really merge into each other. Since the levels of culture arise from men's efforts to satisfy their human needs, we can say that every level has a purpose. Assuming the sixfold division we have made, we can speak of six basic human needs. 1. The need for group security. 2. The need to organize interpersonal power re relationships. 3. The need for material wealth. For the need for companionship. 5. The need for psychological certainty. And 6. The need for understanding. To satisfy these needs, 
there come into existence on each level social organizations seeking to achieve these. These organizations, consisting largely of personal relationships, we shall call instruments as long as they achieve the purpose of the level with relative effectiveness. But every such social instrument tends to be come an institution. This means that it takes on a life and purposes of its own distinct from the purpose of the level. In consequence, the purpose of that level is achieved with deep, increasing effectiveness. In fact, it can be stated as a rule of history that all social instruments tend to become institutions. The meaning of this rule will appear as we discuss its causes. An instrument is a social organization that is fulfilling effectively the purpose for which it arose. An institution is an instrument that has taken on activities and purposes of its own, separate from and different from the purposes for which it was intended. As a consequence, an institution achieves its original purposes with decreasing effectiveness. Every instrument consists of people organized in relationships to one another. As the instrument becomes an institution, these relationships become ends in themselves to the detriment of the ends of the whole organization. When people want their society to be defended, they create an organization called an army. This army consists of many persons with different duties. Each person takes as his purpose the fulfilling of his duties, but this soon leaves no one in the organization with the purpose of the organization as his primary purpose. The purpose of the organization, in this case, to defend the society, becomes no more than a secondary aim for everyone in the organization. Defense becomes secondary to discipline, keeping authority in channels, feeding and paying the troops, providing supplies for intelligence, and keeping visiting congressmen for the people as a whole, happy about the army, the personal comforts of the soldiers, and so on. Moreover, as a second reason why every instrument becomes an institution, everyone in such an organization is only human and has human weakness and ambitions or at least has the human proclivity to see things from an egocentric point of view. Thus, in every organization, persons begin to seek their own advancements or to act for their own advantages, seeking promotions, decorations, increases in pay, better or easier assignments. These begin to absorb more and more of the time and energies of the members of an organization. All of this reduces the time and energy devoted to the real goal of the organization and injures the general effectiveness with which an organization achieves its purposes. Finally, as a third reason why every instrument becomes an institution, the social conditions surrounding any such organization change in the course of time. When this happens the organization must be changed to adapt itself to the changed conditions or it will function with decreased effectiveness. But the members of any or organization generally resist such change. They have become vested in interests. Having spent long periods learning to do things in a certain way or with certain equipment, they find it difficult to persuade themselves that different ways of doing things with different equipment have become necessary, and 
Even if they do succeed in persuading themselves, they have considerable difficulty in training themselves to do things in a different way or to use different equipment. Military history offers numerous examples of the institutionalization of instruments. The Roman army, which had conquered most of the known world by means of the legion, was unable, and probably unwilling, to transform itself into a force of heavily armed cavalry when this became necessary in the late 4th century of our era. As a result, the Roman army, and the civilization it was supposed to defend, were wiped from the earth by the charging horse. Men of Germanic barbarians, beginning with the dreadful defeat at Adrianople in 378, the inability of fighting men to reorganize their ideas and their forces from infantry to cavalry was one of the vital factors in the replacement of pagan classical civilization by Christian Western civilization. In the centuries from A.D. 700 to 1200, cavalry in the form of the medieval knight became as established in Milly military tactics as the Roman infantry had ever been. In 732 the Saracens, whose relentless advance had begun in Arabia the century before, were defeated by the cavalry of Charles Martel at Tours, and the Christian West was saved from Muslim conquest. By 1099 the western counterattack had reached in apex in the capture of Jerusalem. In the three-century interval between these two victories, Germanic and Frankish cavalry, under Charlemagne, Otto the Great, and others, had saved western culture from numerous pagan threats methods of fighting from horseback had become well established, almost formalized, and had begun to as assume those chivalric embellishments that contributed so much to the institutionalization of this method of warfare. Noble youths, as we all note, spent years in justing and tournaments to achieve the skill considered necessary for success on the field of battle. The supremacy of the medieval knight was still unquestioned in the early decades of the 14th century. The defeat of French chivalry at the hands of bourgeois infantry before Courtrai in 1302 was dismissed by the losers as an inexplicable and unrepeatable accident. On the Celtic fringe of Britain, similar defeats at the hands of lower class long bow men were more readily recognized for what they were a new and successful tactic and bowmen were incorporated into the English armies. By means of this innovation, then, Gielish mercenary armies were able to inflict a series of disastrous defeats on French feudal forces in the century following the opening of the Hundred Years' War in 1338. The inability of the French knights to analyze their defeats is one of the best examples we have of the reactions of an institutionalized force to weapons innovation. Of the number, thus blinders on their eyes, the most significant perhaps was their inability to conceive that men of low birth could kill men of noble blood from a distance a similar inability, in the same period, made it impossible for the noble cavalry of Burgundy and of the Habsburgs to analyze their defeats at the hands of Swiss pike men. The advent of gunpowder and the intensification of fire power made cavalry obsolescent in the early 19th century. 
satisfactory and obsolete before the end of that century. Yet by 1900 cavalrymen were still dominant in many armies and in the er Moose resources were devoted to an army that was, by that time, largely worthless. As early as the Crimean War 1854-56, the poet Tennyson saw that it was a blunder to send cavalry charging against gunfire. The American Civil War should have shown clearly the demise of offensive cavalry and even the fraudulent nature of its claim that it was, at least, in the eyes of the army. Yet the post-war reminiscences of officers were filled with the exploits, largely based on institutionalized self-deception, of military men. Reviewing some of these reminiscences, in its issue of O.C. October 31, 1868, the Army and Navy Journal said, The Day of Sabre is over. The late Civil War in America, which taught so much both in military and naval science, made it manifest that cavalry as cavalry had finished its work all ready fifty years before at waterloo the havoc made in the matchless old guard the consummation and ideal of cavalry by the english infantry had destroyed the prestige of heavy cavalry on the actual battlefield but since then the perfection of rifled arms both in infantry and artillery weapons has made its downfall absolute. It is a question of shock against shock, and, with modern arms of precision, a compact body of infantry can empty every saddle in a charging squadron before it arrives to where sabers can be used. Leaving aside, for the moment, the fact that fire, powered, as these words were written, had also condemned any compact body of infantry. We must emphasize the fact that these remarks on a role of cavalry went largely unheeded in military circles. By the end of the century cavalry, men, in all armies except the French and the Germans, were organizing both formally and informally, to maintain a role of cavalry in military forces and to secure promotions for fellow cavalrymen. The talent experts have foreseen what they expect to see or what they are trained to see rather than what is there to see is nowhere better shown than in the tactical discus. Science preceding World War I in giving evidence before the Royal Commission on the Boer War. In South Africa, that intrepid cavalryman Douglas Haig announced firmly, C.A.B. A.L.R.E. will have a larger sphere of action in future wars. That was in 1904. Fourteen years later, as British Commander-in-Chief in France having succeeded in that post another cavalryman, Sir John French Haig had to cooperate with the Commander-in-Chief of the American Expeditionary Force, also a cavalry general, John Pershing. Pershing's obsession with the importance of cavalry made it necessary for him to carry on to wars one against the Germans and another, almost equally virulent, against Peyton C. March, chief of staff in Washington. Much of this struggle, in which Pershing, as a public hero, was generally successful, was concerned with the control of transatlantic shipping space which Pershing wanted to utilize for horses and fodder while March sought to reserve it for men and ammunition. In an analysis of this problem in 1935, 
the military historian Liddell Hart wrote, French, Germans, Russians, and Austrians had unexampled masses of cavalry ready at the outbreak of war. But in the opening phase they caused more trouble to their own sides than to the enemy. From 1915 on, their effect was trivial, except as a strain on their own country's supplies, despite the relatively small number of British cavalry. Forage was the largest item of supplies sent overseas, exceeding even ammunition, and thus the most dangerous factor in aggravating the submarine menace. While by authoritative verdict, the transport trouble caused in feeding the immense number of cavalry horses was an important factor in producing the Russian collapse. Nor does the story of cavalry complete the picture of how military institutions distort men's picture of reality to the injury of their stated aims. The more significant and more frightful example is to be seen in the bayonet. This steely blade was made obsolete by increased fire power almost as rapidly as the cavalry's saber. Yet the change went equally unobserved by most experts. In fact, the cause of the abso lessons of both saber and bayonet, the great increase in fire power, especially from machine guns, went equally unobserved. According to the book, as taught in military schools and training manuals, Victory in battle was achieved by methods perfected by Napoleon, as analyzed by Claus Witz 1780-1831. On this basis orthodox expertise established the victory was to be achieved by the three successive stages of artillery barrage, bayonet assault with infantry and cavalry pursuit with saber. To this, near the end of the 19th century, the Frenchman Charles Ardent du PCQ added the murderous addendum that all three of these stages were really secondary to morale. General Ferdinand and Foch, for many years in charge of advanced training of French officers, entrenched these professional and erroneous views by reporting from his on-the-field studies of the Russian-Japanese War of 1904-05, that machine gun fire would not reduce the effectiveness of bayonet charges. A third example of institutionalized thinking in military tactics in this period might be called the doctrine of the straight front. According to the book, the worst error a commander could make would be to allow his unit to be cut off from his line of supplies than to be caught in a cross fire. To avoid these errors, it was imperative to advance with a straight front against the enemy, even if this required holding back the advance at defensively weak spots and throwing reserves at the enemy's strong points. Simply by reversing this rule in March 1918 by advancing as rapidly as possible and by throwing reserves at the defensive weak points, Thus by passing and isolating his strong points Eric von Ludendorff made the most spectacular advances of the war, bursting over Kamen de Dames and being stopped finally. Ten weeks later, 34 miles from Paris, stopped because he could not bring himself to use his unorthodox methods with full conviction and resources. As a consequence of the institutionalization of military tactics by devotion to the bayonet, the saber, and the straight front,
The early years of World War I saw the largest casual ties in history suffered, in most cases, to advance over a few miles of devastated terrain. In the early months of 1916 almost a million casualties were suffered by both sides in a single battle Verdun while later in the same year another battle saw and cost 1,200,000 casualties, mostly by Bay. One net charges against machine gun fire. When civilians in England tried to force the professional soldiers to use the tank, or civilians in Germany tried to make the professionals use poison gas against machine guns, both were resisted bitterly. When the civilians succeeded in ordering the military to use these innovations, their use was sabotaged by the soldiers. The refusal of the British command, in 1915, to yield to civilian requests to shift their munition orders from ineffective shrapnel to high explosive shells for barrages against trench defenses led to an acute intra-governmental crisis that gave impetus to the rise of David Lloyd George. In the American Army of 1918 a major part of training time was devoted to bayonet practice. As late as 1940 this was still true, although in the interval the casualty statistics of World War I have shown that the casualty figures from bayonet wounds were microscopic. Non-commissioned of Pfizer's skilled in bayonet tactics, were reluctant to abandon something that they knew and could teach, and justified their inertia, in spite of the statistics, on the grounds of the presumed morale-raising attributes of cold steel. From experiences such as these, the French Premier, George Clement so drew the conclusion that war is far too I am important to ever be entrusted to soldiers. Clemenceau might well have broadened his remark to say that everything is too important ever to be entrusted to professional experts, because every organization of such pro Professionals and every established social organization becomes a vested interest institution more concerned with its efforts to maintain itself or advance its own interests than to achieve the purpose that society expects it to achieve. As a consequence, old established armies and navies have frequently been defeated by new forces that have not yet become institutionalized. Thus the Greeks defeated the Persians. The new Roman navy defeated the Carthaginian fleet. The English defeated the French chivalry in the Hundred Years' War. The English navy, barely 75 years old, deep defeat the Spanish Armada. Braddock was defeated. The colonists won the American Revolution. The new French armies of Napoleon defeated the old, bedecorated forces of Austria and Prussia. The new Prussian army of Emil von Roon and Helmuth von Maltke defeated Austria and France in 1866 and 1870. The Boers held off the English for years, and Japan defeated Russia in 1905. Such defeats can be avoided only by constant reform that seeks to reorganize an institutionalized force so that its aim to defeat the enemy remains always paramount. This situation appears in every social organization. Work, PRS join together to get better pay and working conditions. The organizations they form, labor unions, 
soon take on a life of their own, and the workers begin to wonder if they are not now as much the slaves of the union as formerly they were slaves of the management. The kings of England, long ago, created a representative assembly to consent to taxation. Soon that assembly parliament took own life of its own and ended by decapitating, removing, and ruling kings. A political party was organized in 1854 to protect freedom in the United States and to prevent the extension of slavery. By 1868 it was an organized machine of vested interests, a functioning spoils system, whose chief aim was to perpetuate itself in office and whose chief method for achieving that aim was to end the freedom of the whites in the South. The church is organized to bring men psychological security by linking them with the duty. A century later it has become a vested institution with wealth and power, and its chief aim is to preserve and expand these valuable pre-prerogatives. A college is organized to train youth in practical and humane achievements. Later it has become a whole tissue of vested interests in which standards are lowered and admission qualifications relax in order to secure the flow of tuitions that go to meet the institution's expenses. Within its hallowed walls, professors intrigue for promotions and appointments for themselves and their disciples while a condition of undeclared war goes on between d departments and schools to get larger student enrollments in their courses and thus justify bigger slices from the annual university budget. Even in earlier days, professors of the classics resisted efforts to reduce required Latin from for years to two or to make Greek completely elective, or to abolish compulsory chapel, or to establish the first elective course in chemistry without any efforts at any objective analysis of the purposes of these activities or of their role in training youth for later life, that these changes would reduce the established system's control of the college was in most cases, a sufficient argument to oppose change. We see fraternities, established to promote fellowship among students, with the passage of time become vested institutions serving to destroy fellowship by dividing the students into uncordial and competitive cliques to the jeopardy of real academic goals. A game called football was invented about 1870 to provide healthful physical exercise for the undergraduates on bright autumn afternoons. Seventy years later the undergraduates who needed exercise most were seated in the stands of a city baseball park on Friday night, with their flasks and their coeds while on the grass or mud below, the undergraduates who needed the exterior size least pushed each other about under the flood lights. The process by which football was almost imperceptibly transformed from an instrument for providing physical exercise her size to an institution and acting as an obstacle to exercise for many students who loved the game and needed the exercise is as instructive an example of social development as changes in military tactics. The informal games of the 1860s and early 1870s between groups from the same campus led, little by little, to challenges for games with other institutions. This led to travel expenses, more formalized rules, nonpartisan officials, 
and uniforms. The increase in interest led to larger groups of spectators. What could be more natural than to pass a hat among these spectators to raise money for the players' expenses? Defeats led to desire for revenge, and thus to stricter rules of team membership, practice, and training. All of this led gradually to more formalized coaching. This task rested at first with the cap and more experienced players, but, as established intercollegiate rivalries began to grow, an experienced player of previous years, usually the last victorious captain, was asked to return from the outside world to coach intensively during the week before the big game. As other colleges adopted this pattern and several big games a year emerged, the demands on graduates to return to the campus for coaching duty became more than could be fulfilled. The obvious solution, a full-time pay coach, made it essential to have an established team income. Passing the hat among the spectators was replaced by sales of tickets at a fixed price. But sold tickets entitled spectators to a seat, which led very quickly to the building of the first modern stadium 1903. In time stadiums were being built with borrowed funds, with the result that their mortgage charges along with coaches' salaries and other expenses, made it essential that the STA, Boyum's seats, no matter how numerous, must be filled, or nearly filled, on the eight or so Saturdays the year it was used. Gradually the interests of the spectators and the need for football income became dominant over the interests of any undergraduate who liked football or needed exercise. The team had to win, at least most of the time, and the game had to be spectacular to watch. Scouts looked for able players outside and in one way or another, persuaded them to come to the Scouts College to play football. Financial rewards proved, in many cases, to be powerful persuaders. Thus the game shifted from undergraduates who needed exercise to those who had already had too much exercise. That some in institutions where football incomes were earmarked for EDU, cational uses such as for building funds, almost all games were played in baseball parks of large cities remote from the campus, with the result that the team could rarely be seen by its own students. Teams that played on the East Coast, the West Coast, and the Gulf Coast on successive weekends spent much of the autumn traveling and might be away from their college halls for weeks. When the Depression cut attendance in the early 1930s, many games were scheduled in the evening to attract working spectators. For the same purpose the rules were manipulated to give more open play high scores, and superiority to the offense. By reducing the diameter of the ball, it was made easier to pass and harder to kick, in the belief that spectators preferred passing. Restrictions on passing reap work, being a minimum distance behind the scrimmage line for the passer or penalizing successive incomplete passes or re moved to keep the ball moving on a fence.
The referee was instructed to move the ball in 15 yards from the sidelines when it became dead closer than that distance from the sides. At no point in this process did many persons stop to ask themselves, what is the purpose of football anyway? But those who look at football's 90 years of development can see quite clearly how an organization which originally rose as an instrument for undergraduate exercise had become something quite different to the jeopardy of undergraduate exercise. This process, which we call the institutionalization of in instruments, is found in almost all social phenomena. The purpose of music, I suppose, is to provide pleasure from sounds. Various notes are combined together for this pearl and art thus a medium for achieving the purpose of music. But if the same combinations are much used and long continued, they cease to provide pleasure and even cease to be heard. They become banal. New combinations of sound are devised, usually over the objections of the arcade. Mission defenders of the older banal combinations who call the innovations dissonance or even discord. But soon the new combinations become accepted, give pleasure, and after much use become banal. They have become institutionalized. Later students, looking back over the development of music frequently wonder what all the excitement was about. It is difficult for us today to hear the Dyson dance that contemporaries heard in Mozart. We even have some trouble hearing the discords with which Stravinsky so shocked the musical world in 1913. A similar process can be seen in painting, sculpture, art, I texture, drama, opera, poetry and, indeed, in most human activities, works that caused riots at their debuts, like who, goes Hernani or Anius per frock, leave us cold door only slightly moved. They have reached the condition equivalent to music's banality. Expressions that were vivid concrete, evocative, and thus poetical when first used become pro. Yes, I see. The expression let us get underway, which once would recall a full sail vessel getting under the weight of its anchor and thus off to sea, has now become so lacking in these poetic qualities that editors, proofreaders, and even H. W. Fowler insists on spelling way as way. There is of course nothing particularly original in the statement that organizations begin with devotion to a per pose and somehow along the way get turned from that per pose and gradually become a collection of special interests. The historians of religion frequently point out this process by distinguishing between religion and clericalism. To escape this transformation, the Quakers renounce all their organizational features, but it can hardly be said that they have been successful in escaping completely from what seems to be an inevitable process of change. Thorstein Veblen D. voted much of his analysis of our economic system to a similar process which he contrasted by such dichotomies as industry versus business, workmanship versus vested inter BSTs, or the engineers versus the price system. The process of which we speak was generalized by Charles Pangui in Notre Dame when he said,
everything begins as mystique and ends up as politique. In his own experience he had seen the idealism and broad humanitarian of the original Dreyfusards gradually transformed into the selfish grasping at political power of the Clooms Minis tribe. The experience seared his idealistic soul to the point where he welcomed death from German guns in 1914. Fortunately for the survival of mankind most of us are not so sensitive as Pagui. For the institutionalization of social instruments is the most widespread of historical phenomena, and no observant person can fail to notice it. We shall point out many examples of this process in the rest of this volume. When instruments become institutions, as they all do, the organization achieves its function or purpose in society with decreasing effectiveness, and discontent with its performed dance begins to rise, especially among outsiders. These discontented suggest changes, which they call reforms, just as we see happening in American elementary and secondary education today. When these suggestions are not accepted or are rejected by the established groups who control the credit, see is organization, conflicts and controversies begin the dis, contented seeking to change the organization, while the vested interests seek to maintain their accustomed methods of operation. While all good or all wrong is never entirely on one side in such controversies, discontent and controversy are unlikely to rise to any important level unless the organization is well institutionalized and considerably less effective than the society as a whole expects. Accordingly, when this degree of discontent is reached, the vested interest groups are generally tending to defend a relatively ineffective SYS. Tem and the reformers are, among many mistakes, generally advocating measures that would increase the organization's relative effectiveness in achieving its social purpose. The strain between the two groups engaged in a struggle such as this will be called, in this book, the tension of D. Development. From this tension and its ensuing controversy, there may emerge anyone or combination among three possible outcomes, reform, circumvention, or reaction. In the first case, reform. The institution is reorganized and its methods of action changed so that it becomes, relatively speaking, more of an instrument and achieves its purpose with sufficient facility to reduce tension to a socially accept, able level. In the second case, circumvention. The institution is left with most of its privileges and vested interests intact, but its duties are taken away and assigned to a new instrument within the same society. This second method is much used by the English. The king was left covered with honors, but the task of governing England was taken over by Parlo meant and ultimately by a committee of parliament. The Lord Warden of the Sink Ports has a brilliant uniform and a drafty castle, but the task of guarding the seas of England was given to the Royal Navy in the 16th century. The Earl Marshal of England is left with titles and social prestige and still manages the coronation. But the job of leading the army was given to a commander-in-chief 
in the period before the 10th century, when Europe needed defense. An organization called Feudalism grew up to provide this need, and performed its task so well that European culture was preserved from the assaults of the Saracens, the Pagan G.E.R., Mans, and the Eastern Raiders. In fact, Feudalism performed its task so well that by 1100 Europe was mounting that counter-assault that we call the Crusades. But within 300 years, Feudalism had become a vested institution of hereditary privileges and emoluments. It was circumvented by creating in the society a new organization, called the Royal Army to which the task of defense was given. The privileged vested interests of feudalism were neither reformed nor abolished but were left as a structure of honor and rewards that we call chivalry and the hereditary nobility. In the third possible outcome, reaction, the vested inter, the SV's triumph in the struggle and the people of that society are doomed to ineffective achievement of their needs on that level for an indefinite period. The agrarian system of ancient Rome was an inefficient method of producing food even in respect of the existing technical knowledge, but to reform it would have involved abolition of slavery and division of the large estates. The reformers who wanted to do this were assassinated by the daggers of the landlords, some on the floor of the Senate itself. As a result, the economic needs of the Roman system could be met only by the use of other levels, especially by military conquest and by political exploitation of conquered provinces. But in time, both the political and the military organizations became ineffective vested institutions. The result was civil war and eventual conquest by outside barbarians. When an institution has been reformed or circumvented, there is once again an instrument on the level in question and the purpose of that level is achieved with relative effectiveness. But, once again, as always happens, the new instrument becomes an institution. Effectiveness decreases, tension of development rises, and conflict appears. If the outcome of this conflict is either reform or circumvention, effectiveness increases and tension decreases. If the outcome is reaction, ineffectiveness becomes chronic and tension remains high. As a result of this process of historical development, the development of each level appears in history as a pulsating movement periods of economic prosperity alternate with periods of economic stagnation, periods of religious or intellectual satisfaction alternate with periods of religious or intellectual frustration, periods of political order or military success alternate with periods of political disorder or military disaster. This process of historical development takes place on innumerable levels of a society because there are innumerable levels to the culture. But this process is only one aspect of the historical evolution of a society. The other aspect we call historical morphology. It is concerned with the relation ships between the different levels of culture in a society. Before we examine it, we might state, in a formal way, three definitions. One, 
historical development is concerned with the changes that take place on any single level of culture in a society. 2. Historical morphology is concerned with the ways in which one level of culture influences the other levels of culture in the same society. 3. Historical evolution is a resultant of historical development and historical morphology, both acting simultaneously and reacting on each other. Morphology is a word borrowed from biology. It means that the parts of the living organism are adapted to one and other. In its most obvious sense it means that a giraffe could not possibly have the neck of an elephant nor could an elephant have the legs of a giraffe. But it also has a more subtle meaning. When we speak of a heavyweight boxer we frequently mention his best fighting weight. This means that, given his height, reach, age, experience and all the rest of his specifications, there is an optimum weight for his best fighting ability. If he is over that weight, he is slowed up. If he is under that weight, his blows lack impact. On the other hand, if he is at his best fighting weight, there is also an optimum length for his arms or an optimum height. If his reach or his height varies by much from these optimum points, his fighting ability will suffer. All of these are more morphological relationships. The same kinds of morphological relationships appear in a society. The ability of a society to defend itself on the million level is dependent on its ability to provide domestic order on the political level, wealth on the economic level, companionship on the social level, understanding on the intellectual level, and psychic certainty on the religious level. At the same time the ability of the society to defend itself affects its ability to achieve these five other goals. Thus each level is closely connected with all the others. It would be quite impossible to support a mechanized army without a fairly centralized political system, without a highly industrialized economic system, or without a fairly active scientific tradition on the intellectual level. On the other hand, the military system like feudalism, in which men fought as trained specialists on horseback, could be supported by a completely decentralized political system in which there was no state at all or by the purely agricultural economic system, and with an intellectual system which emphasized honor and loyalty rather than knowledge or science. Such a system existed in Western Europe about the year 1100, just as the system indicated in the preceding sentence exists in Europe in the 20th century. Just as there is an optimum length for a giraffe's neck given all his other measurements as fixed, and just as there is a best fighting weight or a best length of reach for a heavyweight boxer given all his other measurements as fixed, so also there is an optimum point of development on each level of culture assuming all the other levels have reached fixed points of development. This optimum point for each level in relationship to the development of each other level is the point at which morphological tension is least. This means that time and energy on each level can be devoted to achieving the purpose of each level and need not be used up in interlevel friction because of the need to speed up the development of another level.
nor need such energy and time be used in any one level in amounts beyond that which would be required to attain a certain degree of achievement on that level because of the inadequacies of some other level. For example, if the point of development of the political level is morphologically inadequate, more time and energy must be expended on the economic or the military level to achieve a certain amount of production or protection from these levels. All this is really nothing more than a rewording of our previous statement that culture is integrative. And just as we said, at that time, that culture never gets integrated and that it would be a bad thing if it did. So we can say here that morphological tension never reaches zero and that it would be a bad thing if it did for then that society would be rigidly frozen into an unchanging pattern and would perish. The backwardness of our religious development or of our social development represents the widespread frustration of these human needs, the low level of our appreciation of the nature of deity, the widespread failure to establish any feeling of relationship between this deity and man's spiritual life and on the social level the widespread frustration of men's gregarious needs in a society built on great cities, millions of unrecognized faces in those cities, and a general lack of established, satisfying social relationships. The advanced point indicated on the economic and military levels indicates the extraordinary success we have had in producing wealth and in directing power against outside societies. Our amazingly high standards of living are proof of the advanced status of the economic level, while the number of outside societies that we have destroyed from the American Indians and the Australian Aborigines to man Darian China or Mughal India are witness to our success on the military level. The advanced states of both of these levels are largely due to the even further advanced state of our intellectual level. The fact that the latter is still in advance of the economic or military level means that it's more full Logical influence on them is still tending to pull them for war. On the other hand, the backwardness of these two levels and, indeed, of the three others as well in relationship to the intellectual level is tending to hold the development of this last level back. Thus each level acts upon all the others. The backwardness of our religious and social developments is undoubtedly holding back the development of the intellectual and political levels. At the same time, the relatively advanced state of the intellectual, economic, and military developments of our society is forcing the political development forward, while the backwardness of the Pope political level has a tendency to hold the developments on the military, economic, and intellectual levels back. The backwardness of one level of development in respect of other levels of development is widely recognized among students of society and is called cultural lag. In the specific case we have just mentioned the cultural lag of the political level, we are also dealing with a widely recognized fact. Our political organization, based as it is on the 18th century separation of powers and on the 19th century nationalist state, is generally recognized to be semi-obsolete. 
we hear demands for a European Federation or for a 20th century Congress. The breakdown of the separation of powers is evident in the rapid growth of administrative regulation which disregards such separation. The need to adapt the United States Constitution to the speed of communication of the 20th century is evident in the 20th Amendment, which moved the inauguration date up from March 4 to January 20. The need for further adaptation is clear from the fact that the Ameri can Congress still spend hours of its inadequate time on verbal roll call votes when it could make a permanent record vote by electricity in a few seconds? The power of vested institutionalism is evident in congressional resistance to a reform that would force congressmen to make a public record of their positions on each bill. One last example of morphological interrelationships, and that the most extreme, could be found in the relationship of the atomic bomb to Western civilization. This bomb was a product of our advanced development on the intellectual, economic, and military levels. The fact that this great discovery of atomic fission was used for a purely deep, destructive purpose is due to the backwardness of our religious, social, and political levels. But the advanced condition of certain levels, as signified by the bomb, has undoubtedly had profound influences on the three more backward levels and will force them to advance more rapidly. There can be little doubt that the advent of atomic warfare on the military level has had profound effects and will have even more profound effects on the three backward levels. People are, in consequence of its use, Turning again to the problem of religion or the inadequacy of our political development. The decentralization of our cities is a process already clearly evident from such forces as improved communications tele, phone and transportation automobiles, and is reflected in the growth of suburbs and the decrease in metropolitan growth. If the atom bomb speeds up this process, it will probably lead to a considerable advance on the social level. As people disperse from the great beehives of modern cities to the more intimate living of the suburbs and countryside, there will undoubtedly be a considerable improvement in the satisfaction of men's needs for companionship on this social level. Even in our oversimplified diagram of six levels, it is clear that the process of morphology is a complex one. There are 36 interrelationships between the six levels we have, and since each relationship works both ways, there are 72 factors at work. But when we remember that the divisions between these levels are arbitrary and imaginary and that really there are an infinite number of levels, each acting upon all the others, pulling these others forward or backward and being pulled backward or forward in turn, it is clear that the reality of cultural morphology is unbelievably complex. The number of factors at work with an infinite number of levels is infinity raised to the infinite power and multiplied by two. This is a number large enough for any one. What happens in a society as a whole what we call historical evolution, is a resultant of historical development and morphology acting both independently and upon each other.
if a level of development is going through the process of development that we have described. The process of institutionalization of instruments with growing tension. The outcome of such tension, as between reform, circumvention, and reaction, may well be determined by morphological factors. The level regarded as if it were alone, may have all the factors necessary to produce reform. But the influence of morphology may produce reaction. Something like this occurred in Spain in the period 1930-40. to 40. There, all the factors on the political level seemed to be leading toward reform but the backwardness of the five other levels and the great power of the institutionalized vested interests on those five other levels turned political reform into Pope political reaction. We have said that the evolution of a society is a resultant of the two kinds of change that we call development and morphology. Let us now turn our attention to this larger issue, the historical evolution of a society, restricting our attention to the kind of society with which we are chiefly concerned, namely, a civilization.